have a lot of antennas coming out. So, um, thank you, Matthew, for the introduction and, and for the invitation to Sherilyn and uh, to Steve also, uh, her own Sayar grad uh, here in New Mexico. Um, so it was great also to visit through the school uh, and see how you guys are engaging um, in advanced design and computation and also the incredible drawings, pencil drawings that are just exhibited down there. Uh, the insects converted to um, machine insects that are incredible. So uh, we haven't seen hand drawings for a long time down there in California, so it's nice to see them. But, but also um, how Matthew and um, and Steve are engaged in the, in the laboratory uh, to kind of reach uh, some of the uh, kind of the new materialities and new fabrications and, and new possibilities that contemporary technology has given architecture. So many of the things that I'm going to show, I'm going to run through a few examples and I'm, I'm going to delay and explain a few of the projects from the perspective also of how uh, new technologies do inform the work. Just going to put the timer set so I don't go longer. <clears throat> so the lecture is called Incongruous Figures. Um, and the idea for the, of the title, it's, it's not only a, a mapping of the work itself, uh, but it's also a way to kind of understand a little bit where I think uh, one of you know one of the channels or one of the lines uh, of the disciplines, the the current state of the discipline is moving towards uh, a way of of questioning few things of what has happened up to now, and also to kind of present uh, a kind of map or an idea of where I think uh, some interesting topics might arise uh, within the discipline of architecture. So, incongruous figures, both words. Uh, somehow present that, um, what I call it, the kind of next step. So the lecture is arranged uh, a little bit through three stages. Uh, the first is, is what I call the affair of the incongruous. The second chapter is a theory of the incongruous, and the final chapter is a visual of the incongruous. In Congress, it goes a little bit against the notion of a single, the dominance of a single ontological uh, architectural project. Uh, the few, I would say the last 10 years had presented architecture with a kind of single directionality onto the kind of demands of, of surface as the kind of driver of, of, of architectural tectonics. So what I call the, the affair of the incongruous, of the affair, the contemporary affair of architecture, I would say that for me lies in the notion of surface. Um, so that's definitely not something new. I, I think that the, the notion of surface as such, where the surface somehow detaches from the building, so it's not a, anymore about uh, tectonics as stereonomics, for example, where tectonics it becomes uh, more ingrained with the body as a, as a mass or the body of the building as a mass. But actually, the surface of the building is one that is independent from the building and is somehow detached. Uh, as it was argued um, earlier on by Venturi and Scott Brown in their study and research on, on learning from Vegas, uh, the notion that uh, there's a new materiality that is the materiality of the sign or the materiality of the image that is one that is, is actually applied onto the building. So the notion of, as you see in the lower diagram, of the decorated shed becomes one where you have an A and B. You have a shed and then you have a decoration onto, onto that shed. So I think that after that moment, architecture really got into a new uh, a new arena. I mean, it, it somehow, somehow enter a new area of research. And for me, the area of research laid a lot on that independent A condition. So how A either wrap B or A become B or, 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 or A got really independent from B. So it's not, I mean, they make the difference between the decorated shed and the duck. 
where the DAC is the actual form of the function and the shed is the representation of that function. So it's not so much about function what I'm trying to refer to, but actually the kind of independence of the image uh, of the facade of the building uh, as not only uh, um, not only one direction like they presented here, but actually as a fully, um, as a full envelope. So I did a diagram as a way to kind of map where I think, uh, how we can trace the history of architecture of the last 10 years, 15 years. Um, and so as a way to see uh, after that, for me, very decisive moment of of the skin detaching the building as the, the moment of where the, the sign or the surface uh, splits from the building. Um, and so this diagram starts to map that through a few examples of, of, of various projects in the last, as I said, uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and I, I, I'm tracing it or like scanning it through the lens of the surface. So looking through the surface once that the, the kind of uh, dominance of that surface, and then how it starts to map uh, within architecture. So the first example, I have a pointer here. The first example is a surface as shed. So very much what I was saying before, the A and B, the body and the skin as the touch. Uh, and the surface as, as shed, I mean, one example would be the Ricola factory by Herson on the Meron. Uh, it recognizes that there's a skin to the building. There's a skin that is either touching the case of Herson on the Meron. They're even, they make that skin very evident, but the skin still works as a facade, a singular facade or an elevation. Um, as a singular facade and an elevation, so you can still recognize the faces, and you can see in this case they're using a, an, a print on poly, uh, polycarbonate, uh, so it's a really simple plastic that achieves, uh, achieves kind of unique uh, conditions by the imprint of a, of a particular image. Uh, in this case, a Blosfeld image of a plant. Um, the biologist from the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. And so the idea that the surface is a shed and that the surface detaches from the building, for me, is the first stage of that independence of the surface. The second paradigm, it's, it's the surface fold. <laughs> so the surface folds here, an example would be uh, Peter Eisenman, a church of the year 2000, done in 98. Uh, what you see is that the surface fold, what it does is that now there's no more shed, there's only surface. The shed disappeared, there's no generic box or there's no generic volume, but actually now there's a pure surface. And the first stage of that pure surface was folding. And the folding, for me, the folding is really the first stage of the evolution of the model of the single surface or the model of the envelope. And so that's why the folding, I would say, is the easiest of all mechanisms for deploying uh, surface effects. Um, so the surface fold doesn't have a, a, an architectural registration because there's no such a thing as a facade, as a roof, uh, as, or as an elevation. Uh, we can still recognize here elevations, top roof, um, uh, you know, so, so you can recognize the architectural elements. In the surface fold, you lose registration of architectural uh, uh, you know, there's certain architectural distinctions. So they have to come back and play new roles. How a window would work in a surface fold, how a door would work, how you add glass, what kind of material you have. So I'm not going to go in uh, further detail with this, but we've seen many examples where the surface fold actually achieves either triangulation, surface triangulations that do engage with uh, structural performance. The next the next stage, um, it's the surface soft. Uh, in this case, I'm showing the embryological house by Greg Lean and a simple diagram of that. And, and what I think is that the surface fold and the surface uh, soft uh, both rely on the paradigm of the computer, the aided, aided, computer-aided uh, design where you do need 
uh, the help of the tools or the kind of mathematical computations that the software would give you to being able to articulate or perform the complexities of those surfaces. So if the surface folds, we'd work with uh, folding as a triangulation, as triangulations and flat surfaces. The surface soft uh, played out as a single surface that is everything. So for me, the surface soft uh, or blob, as it was called, it really defines uh, what it is the uh, ground zero for architecture. So at this point, in the fold, you could still recognize some elements, some planes. Um, in, the, in the soft, you cannot recognize anything. There's no doors, there's no windows. There's no structure that can deal with that. So all those things have to be played out. Frank Gehry had to develop a whole software that could deal with curvature and skin. Uh, uh, Zaha Hadid had to rethink how certain panelization systems would work with, uh, with the curvature. So concrete would be an easy, an easy way to solve them, but panelization and structural system and secondary to tertiary system of structure supporting curvature are more complex means of work that really had to, uh, had to be investigated. So a question in the embryological house, in this case of Greg Lynn, was the main question was not only how the morphology would change uh, as a form of the surface, but actually how to put a window. He would start to cut holes, fold planes. So there was a whole methodology of how you rethink the problem of the window in architecture. As the surface evolved, uh, 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 computer-generated models, the earlier ones from 10 years ago, really had the biggest problem of dealing with surface thickness. I mean, the assumption that a surface could do anything is, is, is quite unrealistic. So how do you give architectural thickness to something that has so much abstraction? So a way to deal with the architectural thickness of a skin that sometimes had no structural way is by thinking and different methods in which you can operate at the level of structure, at the level of openings, at the level of decoration. So the very smooth and simple blob or soft of the earlier uh, late 90s became a more complex uh, surface, more articulated surface of the, um, of the early 2000s. So what you see, so I'm just talking about history, recent history. I mean, we know plenty about previous history before that, uh, even more in the 70s and so on. But I, I just wanted to address the, what really is right behind some of the work that I'm going to show today. So the surface thick, as represented here in the work of Reisen Memoto for the Shenzhen uh, International Airport Terminal, and you can see that the surface has become thick. The windows are holes instead of punch windows. So there's a new way, you know, there's a certain articulation in the relationship between the ornamentation and the porosity of the skin. So it's a kind of very complex problem that was addressed by many architects and, of course, many students in different schools and how to work with the notion of surface articulation. So from the very simple surface problem to a more complex surface problem. So I think that nowadays, what I call the surface incongruous, nowadays we're able to achieve even more complex surface results. Um, uh, it, at this, in this point, it was really difficult to combine multiple ontologies. It was really difficult to, uh, to uh, to uh, change the parameters on a given surface without disrupting the, the, the surface effect. And also there was an aim at, at the kind of uh, presence of a single ontological system that could control any, everything. So uh, windows as gradients, windows structures as part of the skin, patterns as part of the windows, everything really had to work uh, in kind of syntony. So all of the parts had to relate. I think that now we've advanced to a stage where we can achieve a lot more complexity and diversity. 
where the surface is still present because the, the, the way that we work is very much driven by the surface, uh, the surface effect, but other things can be played out. So in this case, this is, for example, a combination between a simple primitive as a box mixed with the sphere primitive that cuts out and bullions the earlier primitive. So there's a kind of negative um, and positive plate where it's not anymore about the thickness of a thin surface, but it's recognizing the mass as a volume, almost as if it has mass. So if the driver, the driver of the architectural paradigm was that of a single undulating surface that became landscape and became roof and became floors and windows and so on, now it can be achieved but more diverse elements that still do address the issue of surface articulation and structure and panelization, complexities in their panelizations and so on, but they can also work as if they were working with solids instead of working with planes. An example, which goes back in time, is Hans Hollein, Reti Candle Shop in Vienna. And what I thought that is interesting from his, uh, other than uh, the issue of the figuration of the actual uh, keyhole on the facade, but the fact that it works with a kind of three-dimensional volume that, that, that seems as if it was a mass or a block. So the, the hole or the, the opening, it's as a kind of carved volume. And it really works with the two ontologies, the one of the cut and the one of the surface. So what I call that the, the theory of the incongruous, it would be, uh, or surface pop, it's, like it, it's what I would call this the compound tectonics, where either as a kind of multiple, a problem of multiple ontologies, uh, as architectural ontologies, even addressing the issue that you can inhabit spaces that are unique and different within one same building. Uh, and again, this is addressing the earlier, you know, the, the later, um, the last few years of the disciplines, uh, where there was an aim at the, this is notion of continuity. There's never disruption, there's never cuts, there's never differentiation, but actually full continuity. So compound tectonics, uh, tries to work with that notion that that kind of certain diversity of the form it starts to play out an important role in defining uh, an architectural form. So this is, I think, it's an it's an interesting model. Uh, if you see, this is the C Walrus uh, trash and trash cans by Chef Kunz, and. And what I think is different, I mean, is art and sculpture has a faster way of addressing certain issues uh, that deal with not only culture, but also deal with fabrication and materiality. Um, in the case of the walrus and trash cans of Kunz, what you see is that you clearly see the two ontologies being played out, that of the pseudo-inflatable and that of the, 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 the diagree of the trash bins and one holding the other one as a structural support, almost as if it's like an elevated plinth. And you can see that it's, the detail is an impossible detail because it's this, this detail would be impossible if, if this were actual inflatable. So you can see that this, these two sculptures are made out of steel. So this is a full steel sculpture. So it's a fully, so it's a problem of the surface. The surface of the diagrid of the trash cans and the surface of the steel plates of the walrus. And then he, he tries to disguise the two surfaces by giving a different texture or materiality. So the way, the way that I was like trying to address the notion of image as a new material, so it's not only that the material, it's a given material, the trash cans are true materials, they address, um, uh, uh, they address their materiality, uh, uh, directly. In this case, they, they, they are hiding their materiality. So the images, the way that they're painted at the surface effect, it shows a, a high level of skill in how you build up this, these objects, but it also shows the kind of the, the testing and the, uh, and the uh, representation of the images onto those metal sculptures. So 
the image becomes a material effect onto steel. He also has other, the most famous ones like the, um, uh, like the, 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 the other inflatables where actually he, he exposes their materiality by showing them very reflective and metallic. But in this case, I think it's interesting to see uh, how the image is, uh, is presented. Uh, there's a thing also, this is Pierre Bloom, and then looking at the incongruous also as an issue of, 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 of the awkward, of the kind of the mixed, um, uh, the awkwardness of the mass. Um, this last example before going into the project, it's, uh, this is it's, it's called, it's an octopus, it's Tim Hawkinson, he's an LA artist. And what I think is very interesting is that he addressed this issue of, the nat of biology in a, in a unique way. So biology, I guess uh, Tom Wiscom was here last week, so I guess you know uh, when, um, when biology is, is, is truly addressed as an architectural problem, not only as an aesthetics, but also as a materiality, as a form, and so on. So I'm not interested in addressing biology uh, uh, so consistently as Tom presented in his work, uh, I'm interested in addressing biology more as a, as a way of bringing new imagery uh, and a kind of an a, a extreme artificiality to the work. So the notion of images as material, in this case, this looks like an octopus, but it's made out of, it's a collage made out of photograph of his lips against a, a glass, and so he's taking pictures of his own lips in the glass, and this is his own hand. So again, something that looks like um, that is something else, but it's actually a kind of an artificial construction of that. So the last, the, the chapter, the, 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 you know, the next chapter would be the one of the kind of the visual of that in Congress, uh, and it's what I call the pretties. So for me, a way to group the different projects uh, was by kind of creating a, a categories on their own. So instead of addressing their categories in architectural terms, I thought about addressing those categories almost as if they had personalities, almost as if the projects themselves had personalities. Um, um, so the three personalities were, I think, each one, each group of projects uh, relies on, it's, uh, it's the first one would be the swave, second one the eccentric and the gang. So the swave uh, addresses more the notion of continuity, almost as if it's the dominance of the swave is the paradigm of the single ontological, the single ontology problem, where you work out a system that you almost not, don't have two systems working together, but actually you have one structure, one logic, one surface, one color that drives all aspects of a single project. So that's what I call a single ontological problem. It's like it's, it really defines one structure and it really runs everything through that. The second one, which is, is the eccentric, which is, which is closer to what I'm calling uh, the incongruous, it starts to look for multiplicities. And it starts to look for multiplicities that are actually diverse. So there are two different, different primitives and how they meet together, or two different surface patterns and, and how they work together. And so as an idea of dealing with the notion of diversity um, uh, by addressing uh, kind of forms that are, are more complex or are incongruous. And the last one it's, is the gang. Uh, the idea behind is that if this, the swave is very much about continuous repetition, where you see, uh, you see sometimes almost endless repetition, where you see gradients, you see uh, systems that really achieve diversity just by, by, by intensities. Uh, and not changes, let's say changes by degree and not changes of kind, by, uh, by kind. <laughs> um, in the gang it's different because you can count them, you know, so they work almost as groups. 
So there is repetition, but the repetition uh, has a certain number. So there's a number of six, a number of 10, a number of three. Uh, so it addresses the notion of repetition, but without uh, going back to, the, the, to that earlier precedent. I would say in time, this is the kind of earlier work, uh, much older work, and the rest are more recent. So the first uh, project for the SWAVE, it's, uh, this is a SIARC, um, as Matthew mentioned, I teach a SIARC and I've been teaching there for, so, for like eight years already. And uh, SIARC has a really interesting program, which is a gallery exhibition program where faculties and invited architects and so on work in the space of the gallery to create uh, one of a kind exhibitions, installations. So they're not, uh, uh, they're not works that somehow come or they, they were done already, but it's actually it's all original work that is made for that gallery. So the first project, uh, the, the project that we did for that gallery, again, addresses that notion of, of, of a system that has a, a lot of repetition and that relies on a single materiality to achieve uh, every aspect of the work. There's no actual functionality. Mostly the idea with this project was that to create an outdoor space in an indoor building. So to create, to create a kind of garden inside of a building. And the garden, which is a highly artificial garden, uh, a plastic garden, I would say, um, and mostly what we did is that we spent all the budget on one material with this PETG that was then uh, laser cut it, cut and laser cut and then reassemble where the joint is actually, the joint is a very simple joint of a screw, but it disappears. It's not made evident. It's not, it's, it's not made obvious. So the joint disappears and mostly the joint works as a way to give, to give structure to the whole. So if uh, this PTC is really thin, uh, um, it's like 0 0.03, um, uh, three, three millimeters. And then the way that, it, that it, it achieves structure is by folding and by the corrugation. So the corrugation works as a as decoration, as a structure. And it also addresses the ground and the side. These are the laser cut files, how we unfolded the form, set up in four by eight, and then um, prepare the the cut lines for that. So as you can see here, it's the floor plan of the gallery. So you could enter and exit through the gallery or meander around the, you know, the kind of space of the gallery. So these uh, tendrils, um, the kind of structural tendrils, set up, um, set up a kind of a space, uh, a landscape inside of, of the gallery space. So the, the relationship, the kind of 3D drawings to the actual uh, construction of the space, is a, it has a one-to-one -one relationship. So it's just simply by unfolding. It, it almost is like it's, this is a large paper model. Um, it's unfolding, cutting, and reassembling uh, in place. It was really hard. The idea of the color, it was really a way of like not demonstrating, we tested few that were completely transparent and then the figuration of the form disappeared in the abstraction of the materiality. So here we wanted the figuration to stay quite present and then to also argue for the materiality to create a different atmosphere. So the walls were painted pink, the floor, the objects. Sayar so director there to only enter once in that space and then he said he didn't want to enter anymore. Um, so, he, so the, the, the space becomes, uh, um, becomes very atmospheric. They are the detail of the pinching and the single screw. Um, and again, co coloration presents itself to kind of achieve that, ex you know, that extreme artificiality. There's no real material. Plastic can actually be anything. So many of the works that, uh, that, that we work, uh, uh, earlier or some of the earlier projects were mostly made out of um, plastics and different plastic composites. That project evolved into something that had more of a function 
Uh, this was for an exhibition in, the, in a gallery. It's called uh, Pico House. It's, uh, it's an exhibition of the history of the French influence in Los Angeles and the earlier years of Los Angeles. And the idea was that to use the same notion, instead of having this uh, gallery that has no walls, you can see you cannot exhibit anything onto those windows. So we had to create museum partitions. So instead of making partitions that were some Durlock walls set up in the middle of the space, um, we created this kind of huge uh, corrugated systems that the structure of those were the form of those. So the, the final layer of that corrugation had the prints of the, the exhibition material. So instead of bringing photographs, it was not a show about old photographs, it was actually a reprint of those old photographs. So we printed the old photographs onto, um, onto the, the final layer, the kind of clear, clear plastic. The rest were uh, white styrene. And the idea is that the curator set up a kind of, um, I don't know if you see clear, it's a little bit blue. Again, again, the unfolding of those surfaces, uh, the multiple iterations. So the curators mostly selected, we give them a whole uh, map of uh, possible shapes, and the curators selected ones that they were interested in because the, the way in which they can circulate uh, surrounding these objects uh, were more useful. Also, because of how many square foot of linear square, uh, linear feet they could get out of some of the shapes. So then the shape had a purpose uh, that dealt with the kind of use. So these are some of the models that we did for the curators. So they could choose where the images would go. And that's how the three of them uh, were presented in the, in the space of the gallery. So, so again, in this case, the, the, the questions that were presented in the gallery space, they became more specific issues uh, with this uh, exhibition in Los Angeles. Uh, this next project is a project for a wall um, in a kindergarten in, in, in Santa Monica. Um, so this is with a, a very long wall. Uh, this is the unfolding of that wall, and at different moments, uh, the director of the school wanted different activities for the children to work uh, or to play with. So the idea of the wall is that, again, trying to bring uh, some diversity to the way in which the, the, the different forms are played out in the, in the surface of that wall. We work with a shingle system a very simple shingle system that addressed the continuity of the wall. It's a really ugly concrete, blocks of concrete wall. They wanted to clad it. So we first clad the wall um, with the shingles, and then on top of that shingle, different programs, like a trellis system, um, a trellis, uh, the way that the planters, these were chalk boards, so that the children could draw, make drawings on the surface. Uh, so there were different layers to that surface uh, to deal with the programs or deal with the form of that surface. Uh, so more trellis, or these are bird, um, um, bird frames, and then some terrariums on to that, on the planters. So again, I think that it, it addresses the issue of the sway because it does rely on one system that has a certain texture. Uh, in this case, uh, the texture, the texture of the shingle, and then it starts to engage with uh, the kind of the lines or the figuration of the different programs. So then there's two layers <coughs> of forms that address. Uh, the length of the wall. So the scales of the project, they, they, they kind of they, they go from really large scale to really small scale. And this is one example of the very small scale uh, project. This was an exhibition for the city of Arezzo. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, the city of Arezzo has a history of, of, of working with gold uh, jewelry. And so every year they have, they have the Museum of Gold, 
jewelry. <laughs> and so the, the, the exhibition uh, was in a homage to Piero de la Francesca. Uh, so addressing the, at the same time uh, the Renaissance uh, painter and then um, uh, the, the kind of small pieces of jewelry. So what we were working is that I think uh, it, it was in the, in the form that, that dealt with both the surface effect and the ornamentation being played out exactly onto that surface. So you can see here how the openings of those, um, the openings of the, the kind of decoration of the ring is literally, uh, it's a hole. It's not a kind of secondary system that comes uh, and somehow ornaments the piece, but it's actually, uh, it's, very, it's, it's very much a kind of a one single ontology that kind of solves all the problems or all the issues of that jewelry. Uh, we did more contemporary versions. We, we've done uh, other lines of jewelry. That the earlier one was for an exhibition. This one, uh, this is the a line that is going into production. But in this case, it's more clearly defined the separation of the parts, still working with a single materiality, but in a way, kind of reframing that you know so the, the the hole or the openings are not just holes, but actually are framed. So bringing back frames are bringing back. Uh, multiple forms uh, to coexist in one single uh, shape. So this is a bracelet, and this is another ring. So the problems, uh, again, the, 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 the larger architectural or disciplinary problems that I was addressing earlier on in the in the presentation, they do come back in all of these projects. And all the projects, they try to address the issues in different way. This is a, a, toddler, a toddler, toddler tableware that we did last year uh, and this year. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of, um, um, of utensils for kids, for toddlers. So the way that the forms are defined and the kind of articulation and the ornamentation of the parts. Uh, so again, in this case, you can see there's no separation from one part of the fork to the rest. It's actually one single surface that addresses uh, the whole object. But then the inserts, the smaller inserts of other materials, either kind of softer plastic or completely different colors. So in this case, color changes as if materiality also would change. Uh, so the detail of, of framing, color really works as a way of testing uh, uh, kind of uh, or enforcing figuration. If the forks were fully white, then you start to see some sense of continuity probably. But in this case, color helps in defining separation between the parts. So framing the edges, separating one object or one surface to the other one or setting up a series, you know, kind of a, an added level of ornamentation uh, onto the form. So the ornamentation is not only by seaming and form, but also by color coding the different parts. Uh, so the plate, so this would be a plate with kind of subdivided moments. So it's the one plate and like uh, five plates into one. And it, almost as if this would be like a mixed typology. It's a toy because the children can play with these edges, and it's also a functional piece, like a foot plate. So those are some of the closer details. <coughs> so the next group is eccentric. And in this, it addresses a little bit larger projects or projects in a larger scale. Uh, this project is a, a Kaohsiung ferry port terminal. It was won by Shesu Reiser, Reiser Umemoto. Um, and so you can see their final project. Uh, but I think that what is, it was interesting, there's a few exhibitions that we've done uh, for Taiwan in different cities in Taiwan. So there's a kind of whole new structure. But the idea for this, what, what, what I call it then the eccentric, is that the idea for this project is start to address more clearly the notion of separating 
the different parts uh, as like addressing, also addressing each ontology with a different program, uh, with a different program uh, in itself. So the three towers are very separated from the terminal. You would see that if you look at the project, the HSC Rice or Momoto project, you will see how clearly it addresses the multiplicity of program with a single surface. So it relies on that, on that single surface to engage the multiplicity of programs. Here, each program is separated, the terminal below the plins, uh, each tower for the offices. Uh, you can see its relationship to the city at large. Site plan or some, so the, there, there is a connection, you know, so the kind of a, a little bit of a study of what is the detail between the connection of the object and the planes. The object in this case becoming a little bit genetic, uh, but, but, you know, the kind of punching uh, skylights coming, uh, bringing light to the lower space, becoming a kind of forest of columns, and then the elements, those unique elements that are the towers. So the towers, they are eccentric. Each one is very different. They almost work also at the stage, at the scale of a ship. And you can see here, these are the skylights that are smaller, I mean, not so small, I mean, they're kind of quite large, but the elements is the, the, that mostly their function is to uh, give light to the plane, and then the kind of, the, the unique quality of those uh, towers. Some of the floor plans. And at this stage also, it was, I think that uh, something that is very interesting is that within architectural research, and as you saw in the earlier examples of the project, I think the relationship with certain advancements in technology in other disciplines such as medicine is even more clear, more technology for a scientist means more discoveries probably, of course, the, better and smarter the scientists, it also helps a lot, but the idea that the relationship between the advancement in technology start to drive or aid uh, an architectural, you know, uh, an architectural investigation, it also has to do with the fact that you're constantly updating your tools for design. So as students, uh, I always say there's a student, there's one student from 2006, it's not the same thing as a student from 2009, uh, Steve here was a student of 2009. Nine. Nine. <laughs> so it's very different to what they're doing now, 2011. So the, the, the issues that every generation of students have to address, they do relate with what things you're learning, you know, what kind of technologies you're learning, what kind of tools you're advancing. And I always think that the school is really the place where you guys advance technology. You know, you advance the discipline. I mean, not advanced technology, you receive technology probably, and you know how to deal with it, and then you really are in charge of working in the advancement of the discipline. Going back to the discipline is interesting as research and as study and as history, but I think that the newer generation have to work uh, very much on that. So, a student asked me, what software you recommend that I use? I say all, except for, uh, except for SketchUp. But, all the softwares, you know, everything from media softwares to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to different machines, how you engage in like advanced fabrication, just learn them all and then you pick, make your pick. And it's never the driver, for many years Maya was the driver, but it's not that anymore. There's no single software that is dominant. Um, and so there's a really mixed technology. So for me, it was interesting to see that the a, a technique such as making models with 3D print machines would bring these white, horrible machine models that, you know, they, they, they are just all look the same, all different forms, but they all look the same. So for me, I think that you, 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 have, to, you have to engage in the technology and then give it your own tint, let's say. So what we did is that we took all those 3D print models and we painted them in color. In research in SciArc, I'm working a lot with looking at printing literally images on the 3D prints. We're not succeeding very much in many. We have some robots that will help us paint some models, but the idea that you can take it one more step, so you don't really know this is an old model, it's a new model, what technology, but it, it puts you, you know, it's, 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 you are in charge of choosing how you want to take uh, the learnings or the kind of representations that you, you receive. So in this case, these are highly articulated 3D prints 
uh, and they're painted by hand. So I, you know, at this point in this competition, I was a little bit against the render. The render was secondary for me. I, I wanted to go back to say, well, the render needs to advance a lot. It has to be very perfect. So we don't have much time for this competition to submit. So we're just going to really make most of the models and take pictures of the model. It has a kind of very different materiality. So you could take it apart. You could take the model apart. Uh, and you can address the city and so on. So similar time to that is another competition also for Taiwan of a tower. And it's, uh, it, even though that it really works, so here, uh, for me, it was a test. You start with a kind of a, a black, a kind of a shadow, a drawing, a black and white drawing, and you make sure that things are very different. Uh, so color coding is not like, it's so no in, not so indexical, meaning that you paint something in one color, paint something in another color, and then that what gives the difference. But actually, the difference belong in the geometry, belong in the form. So after you can see that, then you can start color coding. You know, once you kind of achieve the differences between the part, then, then we start working with the color coding. Earlier investigation, this is a flower vase that is now under production. Um, earlier investigations, you can see the kind of line drawings. Uh, for me, what it was important, something that it was quite lost in the last few years, was that uh, things were not delineated. I mean, nothing was framed. Uh, I think that modernism got rid of the frame uh, uh, in the earlier part of the last century. I got rid of the frame or the decoration of the frame, even the decoration on the facade. So for me, it was interesting that the frame was actually a way of exaggerating a form, the form of a window or the form of a door and so on. So these studies are study on, uh, studies on framing. So framing the different uh, veins or framing the different parts, kind of delineating uh, the different forms. Again, you know, the, the kind of catalog of different vases, uh, flower vases. Uh, so this, this is a small project for a playground, uh, a playground, a competition in Finland. Um, and so in, in here, you can maybe see more clearly, there's like really a distinction between the different parts. And uh, working with a playground allow for more playful, except when somebody, when I saw, because I have a small daughter, I saw Mickey Mouse Club and I said, oh, oh, <laughs> this is not good then. Uh, so, so don't think of Mickey Mouse Club, but it's, uh, uh, so it, they, they addressing the different elements, not as primitive forms like in that case, but actually as a very different ontology. So the windows are framed, uh, the different programs are kind of uh, played out with different forms. The thing is kind of awkwardly elevated from the ground. So it, it was not trying to be a caricature or like a, you know, a character, but actually a more kind of playful form. And the landscape, the highly uh, contour landscape. This is another competition that we did for this Union Station in Los Angeles. It was an idea of how you bring the speed rail to LA. And one of, uh, so it was mostly, again, ideas competition. And, and the main thing for us was that uh, Union Station is a really large uh, train station in Los Angeles. This would be Los Angeles Street. Uh, the one thing for us was to bring back the notion of, of landscape over a park. You know, Los Angeles doesn't have that many parks. So one way of addressing the project or the problem of the project was to bring a large park that not only dealt with the speed rail, but also dealt with new programs, like a, a new performance center, uh, a, a really large hotel and smaller venues and museums and so on. So it was a park of buildings. You know, the, this is the freeway, the 101, and through this is the Disney Concert Hall is here and the Cobb Human Blow building. So uh, Grant Avenue has become, that part of LA has become a kind of a, a museum of iconic buildings. So what we did is that we just play them out, all the iconic buildings, new iconic buildings in one park. And again, it's an elevated park. 
So the hotel with the concert hall, uh, the theater, and so on, all, all through, that, through that part. So the city, as I was saying, so this is uh, 101, I don't know if you see, but the downtown Los Angeles. Um, the, the, the idea that, that the contours, the kind of, the registration of that park had to stand in strong contrast to the grid. So you can see the, the, the kind of articulations or the contours of that form, they go in strong contrast to the building. Not only with the renders where we made the, the city blank but, and white, but it also that the, its geometry was very different. The iconicity of the building had to do, so here you can see how the building starts to, the, the, the park and building starts to stretch uh, through the side to reach the Union Station, to reach the other side, which is the tower. This tower is for the train terminal and other things from that. This is the speed ray would take this route. Another, uh, a new competition from this summer. Um, it's, it's one that start, uh, but this is a kind of the first di the, 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 the diagram, the first diagram that kind of initiates the competition. So similar to that competition for the Kaohsiung port terminal, this one tried to address more clearly what is the shape of the primitive and what is the shape of the plinth. Very much almost like looking at a Brancusi sculpture where it's not, it's the, the plinth is never generic or the pedestal is never generic, but actually the pedestal is as important as the form. So he would design the pedestal the same way that he would design the form. So we wanted to design the pedestal the same way, which is the plinth and then work the form, but keeping their identities unique and separated. So these are different studies. This is for an opera hall, uh, an opera hall and a kind of small uh, hall. Uh, um, and again, um, in this case, how the plinth really became the uh, generic, but at the same time uh, uh, formed. And then the two, the, this is the opera hall and this is the small auditorium, uh, how both of them uh, work together. They wanted this, uh, this, this competition, we didn't win, but it's, it's still ongoing. So there's, um, they're going through second phase. Um, so we'll know soon who are the winners. But the idea that the, the, how you start to address the smaller details of the connection between those larger forms and, and that plane, and how you address windows, how you, and how you address surface texture or ornamentation within that skin. Uh, that's the interior space. And that's the lobby space. So you can see here almost as if the lobby is like there's one building inside of another building. So it is working as a, if it was a shell or a single surface shell. But the second building, the inner building, which is the auditorium with the balconies, the, the auditorium inside, it kind of somehow separates, uh, separates the, two, the two parts or the two entities. So that, that's uh, the building at night more building at night for the competition. Now, I've been forbidden to my students to put any sky. They haven't seen this image, but from now on, I'm not putting any sky. I'm against the skies. Uh, they're okay, glitch, but again, in a competition, you, you want to win, but in an academic environment, they're not allowed. Um, so, so again, the, the kind of the large scale, uh, the auditory, so a form within a form, uh, the kind of two forms together. Uh, the smaller and the, the way that they 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 work with the plinth, uh, and also the way that they locate they work with each other. So it's not a duplicate; they kind of the same family, but they're unique uh, in their own terms. That's so. Those sort are of the two, the large uh, opera hall with a hidden flight tower inside of the form. So it ate a full building. So the last group is the the gang. The last group is the gang. So again, they are still eccentric, let's say, but they're not eccentric enough that they can be separated. Uh, they, 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 they form groups. So I think that's a way, for me, the notion of uh, repetition, uh, uh, of discovering difference in repetition, for me, that is very much an investigation that it's a little bit over. 
uh, where you have systems that achieve endless repetition and a small variation within that repetition works. I think that it's either a problem with a, a buildings that or forms that have much stronger figuration or systems that are, you can count them or you can, you know, you can devise them, you can measure them. So the first, the first uh, project was Alice, was an installation for a gallery in Los Angeles. And the name came very much from the Alice in Wonderland text. The, the idea was that the, the Alice, the name, just the name itself, it already has baggage. So if you put a baggage onto a form, you get double baggage. So you get the baggage of what you remember from Alice in Wonderland, plus the forms that you're presented, so you're completely confused. Uh, and then we started with a study, uh, and then at this point, uh, we were really interested in the notion of figuration, a strong figuration, and in a way, very literal figuration. So starting with orchids, tracing the orchids, making 3D models of orchids. So very much tracing the potentials of, of extracting figuration from a given object and then playing out, uh, playing out that figuration. And another thing that I, I'm interested in, why I think the, the problem of the continuous um, uh, the problem of the endless or the gradient, uh, it's an interesting problem, but it has to be associated with a new problem. And in this case, that, that issue or the new problem was composition. So how you bring back composition. If, if for many years people thought that the computer had a brain or that you would think that you, you put some scripts and the, it would run uh, certain forms, which you can still do, but you do it along your input. So it's not true that, I mean, you still rely a lot on instinct, and you still rely a lot on, compos for me, composition is very much about instinct. So this is very much like a series of forms and how they bring back and they build up one form or on one composition. Uh, all of the geometries and so on, they very much come uh, uh, this is the second edition by Tenniel of the Alice in Wonderland drawings. And how strong is the black outline on the drawings, how it separates patterns. So you can see there's a black and white drawing, and then after that black and white drawing, there's a color drawing that infills. It's not a paint by number, because the forms are somehow has to have their own pattern, but it, it has certain flatness, you know, a certain, which is an architectural flatness let's say, of, of, as if we had materiality. So, so that flatness, this and a few other exhibitions that I'm going to show here work really very much as a wall. In this, because it's very much like a facade or like an elevation. So for me, the wall, if the other one was more as a space, not even touching the walls, in this case, it, 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 it literally supports itself on the wall. So they're highly ornamental. Uh, so you can see here there's two, there's only one material. In this case, color uh, was more a, a study on materiality, on the, 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 this orange is the default orange. It has no mixture, it has no extra tints. It's just the orange that you buy uh, for the urethane and the vacuum form we use, uh, um, which has laminated the PET sheet with vinyl pitch, so which is the, is the same number orange. So no combination as we will later study. And the idea that you have the same, the form that in this render, it looks very similar. It all looks very similar, but in, in actual fabrication, it was an idea of two part system. Uh, one part, which is a mill base with a vacuum form. With, with the vacuum form, which you use generally, as you guys have been doing here, you use materials, but it's really difficult to vacuum form color, as we discover, as you probably discover, you get white, black, or transparent. So what we did is that we printed, we laminated, or you can print, which is something that we were doing with my students sire. We printed the, the sheets, the PET sheet, and then we vacuum formed them. That way you get an extra, an added layer of materiality. So in this case, laminated, PET sheet, vacuum form, and trim. And then the second material was an urethane that we cast. We created the molds, which are these kind of flower molds, negative flower molds, cast and glued together. So that's a, that's a vacuum form of a black styrene 
or gray styrene where we would pour. So the vacuum form becomes a mold. So you can use something that is very analog, like pouring and casting, with something that is more digital, like CNC uh, milling and vacuum forming. So the final piece, the idea is that this, they plug in to a kind of negative, so they're almost like Lego pieces that plug in into the wall. And these objects plug in into the, so these are soft urethane with hard vacuum form uh, surface. So the forms, again, this, there are three types of flowers, and there's only, and, and these forms are unique. So how you work with something that has repetition and a lot of um, uh, similarities, uh, a lot of duplication with something that is, that, is, that is unique, like the contour of those forms. So there, again, you can see sometimes we trim the vacuum form uh, plastic, uh, and we left the vacuum form, I, I'm going nerdy onto this, ex just to support the lab here. So I'm going through every detail of how these things are fabricated. I, I, I don't know how to make these things if not this way. In this case, we did it with my team. In the other exhibition, I, didn't, I was not involved in the fabrication of them. So this one, we suffer every detail. So again, we left the meal the mill pieces of the, the foam, the high, uh, high density foam behind, so they could be structured. Otherwise, the vacuum form is not very structured. So here are more pictures of that installation. So that came from an earlier investigation also on the notion, again, going back to other system of figuration, in this case, vacuum forming and a more simpler way, but this idea, this is the Schindler house, uh, uh, where the Max Center is right now in uh, Los Angeles, and these are the gardens. What is interesting from the Schindler house is that it splits the house, so the garden comes inside of the house. So we trace this uh, competition organized by the Mac to do a wall of, uh, of, of plants, uh, so we did this wall, flower wall, um, but we did a notation of the existing vegetation in the, in the building. It has a vegetal garden, it has different plants. So they highly, they kind of, we did kind of artificial drawing of the actual, you know, things that were there. This is a really old render. Another competition, this is a, a competition in Poland, where again, the same thing that what I'm saying, like finite duplication of of the competition, the site, they were asking for a museum right here. Uh, this is a really an, an old park with a castle here, and new infrastructural infrastructure interventions put this horrible freeway in the middle, cutting the park in two, they wanted the park to connect. So what we did is that instead we put the, the museum under the bridge. Probably that's what we lost and many other reasons. But, so the museum was working almost as if like mushrooms. The skylights of the museum are kind of mushrooms that surround that freeway or that freeway or that kind of avenue. So the kind of first party of the building was trying to deal with a the problem. They wanted the site right here, the building of the site, so we work with the site uh, under, under, like if it's growing under the freeway. It's a house in the Bahamas, a project for the house in the Bahamas. As you can see, for this project, which is an earlier investigation, we look very much at the work. This is Andy Warhol's Wild Raspberries, Andy Warhol and Susie Frankfurt. They, they created this very strange uh, uh, book of recipes, but the recipes are all fake. If you read through the recipes, they don't make any sense. And they were written by Andy Warhol's mother, so it has a lot of mistakes. Uh, so it's a playful way of, of addressing uh, see, like culinary uh, form. So it's, like the, it, it's more about the drawing and the narrative of the recipes than the actual recipes and the form of those. So it was really interesting to see uh, how some of the dishes, let's say, the kind of decoration, separation, and ornamentation of every one of those, those details to emphasize the different form. So what we did as a, as a color chart, of charting color, we took candies, 
uh, and we pixelated them and then we took the colors from them and then the color palette came from those earlier studies on candy. So how, how can you achieve in a building the kind of that sense of almost as if they were large scale candies? So we just, we just took the colors from them, from desserts and from candy. So those are the colors that are present in this. And then you can see here, similar to, this, to the on the work of the Susi Frankfurt drawings is that to emphasize separation of details, framing of details, and so on. So the investigation, none of these have actual strong functional arguments. Um, you know, ornamentation actually works as a way to kind of work with architectural problems such as the roof to the wall, the door to the window, the plinths to the base, the landscape. So our larger architectural problems instead of, at this point not yet because probably we haven't been working in large scale buildings, but it's, it's mostly uh, are the, the problems of the form of the building, not of the systems or infrastructure of the building. This is a project, this is an ongoing project that we're doing as a research for a client for a house in Los Angeles. So the departure for this project was a study of the case study houses. There are 28 case study houses in, a, in Los Angeles. It was a very interesting program that started with a magazine and then uh, many or most of these houses are built. Uh, and it's an interesting houses that are in the earlier part of, uh, in, of the last century, it, it engaged not, so, not only a new way of living because uh, there was no service areas for the houses, so the new the kitchen is involved in the house, and so on. Things that were completely new for a new uh, way of living for people, but also they engaged in new materialities such as the IMS, uh, looking at new construction systems, and Richard Neutra, and Shin, you know. So there are many. So what we did is that we, this is case study eight and case study nine. Case study eight is a Char, a Charles and Ray Eames house. And case study nine is Eames and Ero Saarinen. And uh, what you see here is that the idea that we were seeing earlier that the outside, it's a part of the house. So the garden is one more room and uh, LA weather permits that. So we did some diagrams in all of the case studies, but this is the more relevant to our case, was that in this case you can see the split and the garden and the way that the inside also operates a garden. In this case, the garden really gets inside of different parts of the, of the living. So sometimes even the living room, it's a garden, it's not a living room, so, but it's combined. Uh, these are those houses, the Eames houses and the Eames Aninen house, where you can see the hatch of, the, of the, the, the outdoors coming inside. So the idea that we were working with this client is the, the notion that you, the, the house can be kind of really genetic uh, in its outside, but the way that the outdoor enters the, guard, the house and separates the house into two parts in this case is a way of of achieving kind of the complexity of one geometry that engages the other one. So you, you have the two ontologies, the one of the outdoors and the one of the indoors that are addressed by the change in materiality and the form. So uh, these are kitchen and living room and these are, uh, are sleeping quarters, let's say, the two bedrooms and the master bedroom and then the garage and then the outdoors, that is a way of like communicating the two and a way of connecting separating and connecting. So you can see here in the plan the kind of forest of columns and then the two, uh, the kind of two parts of the house and how uh, the, the garden really gets inside, starts to get inside of that. So here are some pictures. So one way of dealing, so the kind of negative space of that surface. So one way of dealing with the semi-outdoor space uh, was to work with this column. So we're now working in more detail with the materiality of the column and so on, but the features are, is the glass and the column. So these are very much like umbrella columns, like the ones that shown some wax by Van Lord Wright. Uh, of course, they come from there. So the columns populate that negative space, and they are not fully enclosure, and they are not, they're, they're not either indoors or outdoors. They work as both. 
So the columns uh, grow up, uh, build up uh, through the space, and they have like seeds, so the column becomes furniture as well. So again, this is another example. We have a few renders, but for the client, uh, which is we work a lot with the models uh, here, this is, we're painting them now, okay? So this is not a white 3D print, only there with powder, but it's actually, they're being painted right now. So these are the kind of first stages of that house, of, of working with that, the kind of negative. So the last project, this is a project uh, for um, an installation that it was just came down in Chicago for, at the Art Institute, at the new wing of the Art Institute. And the installation, uh, again, it, you can see the outline is very similar to the outline of those mushroom columns. So we recycle a lot of the ideas from different projects. So they, there's, a, uh, there's some consistency through the work. So the, the chronopios are, it's an installation of, uh, an installation, of a site-specific installation. So it doesn't have a particular function other than working in that space, similar to the other installation. So this installation, the way that it works is that it starts to set up uh, a notion of a 2D, a kind of shallow 2D. This is the first study that we did where you can recognize more the, the forms and the contours and their shapes as different layers. Uh, these are the different parts that build up that form. And some of the study models. Here, these are more examples of how you not to use white 3D prints, but to color code 3D prints, hand paint and so on, and the kind of character of the, of the, of the model, um, the physical model. So laser cut, these are all laser cut pieces that were painted, painted so, you know, so, so we could get 116 without having to customize acrylic. Uh, so there's no acrylic in 116 that comes uh, standard. So the laser cut pieces painted in the back and the 3D prints that are painted inside. So this is the first investigation that was mostly they can identify in those smaller units. But this exhibition, this installation was too expensive. The scale of these objects was too large. So what we did is that we just, we did, we did, we painted, all this is fake, is painted, and we only fabricated the smaller units. So it says, if, since we don't have that much money to make bigger pieces, so we do them smaller, and we create a, a fake 3D. So it works almost like a cartoon, uh, a kind of 2D cartoon. You can see it almost looks as if there's many forms or many shapes. And the fact that the, the, drop, col the drop shadow effect of those elements, this, this was painted by a single person at the Art Institute. He projected the lines color coded and did a paint by numbers by hand. So it was quite a, an incredible work by him. I don't have his picture, but I should show it. And so these are just the illustrator drawings, but the idea that the unit almost works uh, along the pieces and then you, you know, it's, it's a kind of a fake uh, surface effect that is producing that space. So this is the actual installation. So for this, it was in a circulation place, so you, you start to get a glimpse of that installation. And as you move in, you started to see the whole place. So you can see here the painted, the 2D painted. At one point, we wanted to laser cut them. No, 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 we painted. It actually cost them more in the museum to do that, but it was not in my budget, it was in their budget. So that was my way of tricking the museum. Uh, so. So again, this is my passion, it's only those guys. Uh, so the guy, this guy is the guy that paints the, the walls white. One day they say, you have to paint this instead of white. Uh, so it was a, a way of kind of addressing the drawing as a, as a spatial element. So all of this, you know, what I was saying, like the image can become material. In this case, the image became material for the wall. It became a kind of a materiality. We spend a lot of time choosing what colors go there. Uh, you know, so it looks like a simple, anytime you work with colors, actually you spend a, more time choosing the color than do, making the forms. So the, the actual units 
They were made in Kentucky by a fabricator, uh, by a fabricator there called Dura Parish. And then he, uh, he mostly, the, the, the way that they're done is that they are milled in foam, low density white foam, really simple. And then they are coated with urethane, the spray with urethane to get it hardened. And then they're painted. And then these are domes. And it has some lights inside. Uh, so the idea is that you can see, you can recognize where these things are coming, uh, becoming more 3D, but in Shinedal, it, it, it kind of embeds the drawing into a kind of a 2D fresco. It, it's, it's working more like a fresco, and that's actually how it was done. So what I was saying earlier, you can see some of these details in other projects that we've done. Um, uh, the, 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 the issue is that this is a single surface, except for the domes. It's all milled out of one block. So one way of addressing diversity, almost as if this look at a kit of parts, we, they couldn't do it out of parts, so we just painted as if it was done of parts. So it's very fake. But it's uh, so we're like in Hollywood influence. Uh, so all these elements, they look as if you plug them in, but actually they are painted, color-coded different. So uh, a way of addressing parts, an architectural problem of parts, instead of an architectural problem of hiding the details or hiding the seams or hiding the joints. So here it's really addressing the joints and the differences, even though they don't really exist. Um, so again, it's an installation, it's an architectural installation and not an art piece. Um, and this is the last slide. Thank you very much. I, I don't think, I, I think that thanks, thanks to many architects, uh, I can say that these things can be built. I mean, you have plenty examples with the work of Frank Gehry or the work of Saha Hadid or the work of Wolf Briggs that are actually now building at the large scale. I mean, they have offices. They started with offices that maybe had 10 people and they work in offices that have 200 people. Um, and they are keeping, they haven't like given up on their ideals, let's say, but they actually are being able right now. So they are 65 or something like that. So I have many years still to go, hopefully. Um, so it comes late to architecture, but I think that there are powerful demonstrations that the things can be done. Last summer, um, Frank Gehry came to thesis at Sire, and then he was walking by thesis, and then other critics that were visiting were dismissing much of the work for being too uh, out there, let's say. And Frank, the first thing, he'd sit down, he'd tell the student, you have to believe that you can do it. You know, you have to think that you can do it. Otherwise, you know, it's just give up today. So he's, he's you know, he's not presenting himself as a, as a true as a proof of that. But actually, I think that those architects paved the way to things to happen. In my case, I mean, you saw Tom Wiscombe last, last week. He's more, he worked for 10 years for Wolf Briggs, for example. And, um, He's more interested in the actual influence of these things with the systems of a building. So the construction of the building is the driver, I would say, of much of the form. In this case, those are not the driver, but I don't think that nevertheless, the problems that I address are non-architectural. I mean, they are architectural problems. I have only been able to test it at this scale. That's why I say this is a fake detail. Um, and so, so I think they still played out as architectural problems, uh, but, but they do address um, the large scale. So that's why for me, I, I'm interested in jumping where, where I can actually build stuff. Maybe the house would be another test to start working with that. And, and then you'll see that in the, the house, which has an actual client, is more, um, the details go much slower <laughs> to what they can do. So, so, you know, like the Bahamas house, that is a pure investigation uh, on, a, on, a, on a form. So, so I think that it's, I, you know, also for students in Senegal, I think that it's important that um, the student understand the range of architecture. I mean, I have an education, I spent six years in undergrad in Argentina. Um, and then I decided to go to a grad school that was t totally different to what I learned for six years. And so it was a way of like expanding knowledge. So, so I guess that the test of building stuff will like change 
some things, but you know, there are problems that are architectural that are there, that will be there. Hope it addressed the question. But <laughs> I think I, I agree with you. I think the playground is the one that addresses the more the, the distinction of the you know the, the multiple forms. Um, and I think in the last one that I showed, uh, the one for the opera hall in uh, Taiwan, uh, it, it goes back a little bit to the single surface problem. I think in there, the, it doesn't address that clearly the kit of parts problem, uh, but it, because it starts to try to address more the issue of the, the plinth as a part and the form as another part as like two part system. But I think, I don't, I think what, what I say fake is because I think that it's, uh, in this case, the fabrication played a role and budget plays a role. Um, but I, I do think that, that working, that we've tried to, for too long in the discipline of architecture to disguise or to hide details. You know, almost that like you hide the joint, you hide the seam. And I think it's interesting to kind of play them out more. So, you know, how some, some of those elements are revealed. But I don't mean the, like the structural elements are, they're all, always highly ornamented or they're like um, framed, you know, and, and set up. So I think it is, that's why I, I think this, this uh, presentation is very much a hope, you know, <laughs> a looking towards where the work would go. Uh, and in some cases, it's still testing other problems. But yeah, I mean, your question about, I think the playground is the one that is more clearly uh, complex in, in terms of its, uh, the, the, the issues that I'm trying to address, or more closer to those issues. Okay? Thank you.